I just want to apologize to the viewers and their moms and my mom. And I'm just sorry to everyone. I'm so, so sorry that I'm doing this really old and silly joke that's really played out. But we're doing found footage horror films at the horror movie syllabus. So, so I had to do it. What was that? Welcome back to the horror movie syllabus. My name is Professor Victor and I'll be your host as we go through all of the essential, interesting, noteworthy, and downright notorious horror movies. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out our introduction video. That'll explain a little bit about how the horror movie syllabus works. But in short, here at the horror movie syllabus, we take a particular subgenre of horror and look at three representative examples of that subgenre. Today, the subgenre we're looking at are found footage horror movies. And found footage horror is a subgenre that tends to be a little bit divisive amongst horror fans. There are people that really, really love it, and there are people that really, really hate it. So it tends to be somewhat of a controversial subgenre. I tend to be one of the people that like found footage when it's done well. And the examples that we're going to look at today are going to show just how good a found footage movie can be when it's done well. Now, for those of you that have looked at the horror movie syllabus at horrormoviesyllabus.com, you'll see that there's two subgenres on it, found footage and mockumentary. And you might be asking, what's the difference? It's a pretty good question. The difference is nuanced, to be honest. Uh, I would say that the the mockumentary is really focused on presenting the movie as a faux documentary. It's got a documentary style to it, and it's trying to convince the audience that it's an actual documentary, whereas the found footage movie is really just a, a first-person camera that has ostensibly been found uh, after the events that have taken place on the recording. That said, that distinction is blurry when it comes to these kinds of movies because there's a lot of them that really could fall under either or both subgenres. Some of the movies that we're going to look at today do present themselves as a bit of a fake documentary, but I've chosen to put them here because I think that the found footage aspect is the, the prevalent or primary aspect of the movie. And when we get to the mockumentary subgenre, you'll see that I've kind of taken the opposite approach and I've put movies that I think where the, the documentary aspect or the fake documentary aspect is the primary thrust of that film. All that said, there may be some of you that feel like uh, maybe these two subgenres didn't need to be separated out or that movies that I put in one subgenre actually belong in another subgenre. And if so, that's great. I'd like to hear about that in the comments below. Uh, I decided to split it up into two subgenres in part because I think there's enough noteworthy films to talk about to warrant having the the broader conversation about two separate subgenres and because I felt like some of them really lean into the faux documentary aspect whereas other ones really kind of abandon that notion entirely so to me it feels like it makes sense to have them separated out into two but if you disagree tell us about it let's hear your opinions in the comments below now, for those of you that are not at all familiar with uh, found footage or mockumentary movies, for that matter, the premise is fairly simple. It's basically an entire movie filmed as if you're seeing it being filmed by somebody who is in the story. The cameraman is a character in the story. Uh, they're very effective. They're also very cheap to make, which is a big reason why they got so popular, uh, especially in the last 20 years or so. As I indicated previously, done right, it can be a really clever way to tell a story. Unfortunately, because they're so cheap and uh, so easy to make, uh, there is a glut of them that really weren't as well made. And uh, and I think that's part of why there are a lot of people that dislike the found footage uh, subgenre, that there's so many uh, subpar uh, examples of the, of the subgenre to point to that it really can burn people out. I'm hopeful that the movies that we look at today will remind the people that don't like the found footage subgenre just how good that subgenre can be, uh, again, when it's done well. As usual, we've uh, separated the movies that we're looking at today into levels of undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate, and those are going to be, uh, simply put, the, the chronological order that they came out. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the movies. The first movie we're talking about today, our undergraduate level selection, is... It's the Blair Witch Project. 
Now, you all knew that this one was going to be on this list uh, from the cold open alone uh, from my Blair Witch outfit. Uh, and of, of course, it has to be there. It's kind of the quintessential granddaddy of the found footage subgenre. Now, a lot of people think that it actually is the first found footage horror movie. That's not accurate. Uh, probably the original found footage movie would be Cannibal Holocaust. And we'll be talking about that in a, in a different part of the horror movie syllabus. But there's even a movie that came out about a year before the Blair Witch Project called The Last Broadcast, which we'll also be talking about in another part of the horror movie syllabus. So it's not the first movie, uh, but it is the one that gets credited with uh, the launch of the found footage subgenre in proper. Uh, it's really the movie that kind of sparks the whole uh, craze of the found footage movie, or at least that's what it usually uh, gets a reputation for being. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, The Blair Witch Project came out in 1999 and it was presented as actual found footage. As the story went, uh, three kids had gone out into the woods in search of uh, the Blair Witch, this popular myth in Maryland, and they never came back. And then a year later, uh, a class doing a, a project out in the woods came across uh, the tapes from their project. And that's really uh, the crux of why the Blair Witch Project worked. It came out in 1999 when, A, people hadn't really seen something like this before, and B, the internet was starting to become pretty commonplace. Everybody started to have access to the internet at home. So the filmmakers used those two things to present the movie as real. People actually thought that this movie had been put together using the footage that was found of three actors, or excuse me, three three people who had gone out, three film students who had gone out into the woods and disappeared, uh, did not know that they were actors. Uh, and the filmmakers did a really good job of making sure that the actors stayed out of sight during the time period where they were doing the press for this movie. They built a website out that seemed like a real website of somebody or somebody following this case of the missing, the missing people and established the, the long history of all the weird things that had gone out in the woods in Maryland. It really, really was convincing. Again, this is a period of time when people don't know uh, what a found footage movie is and don't realize that not everything on the internet is is, is, is true. Um, so it was very, very effective. People really bought into it. And I think that's the reason why there are very polar opposite opinions about the Blair Witch Project. There are people who love it and there are people who think it's terrible. And I don't know this for sure. I haven't done the market research enough to tell. But my suspicion is that if you saw it early on, especially if you saw it and thought it was real, you love it. And if you saw it later on, knowing that the hoax is a hoax, uh, knowing that it's it's just a movie, uh, you're disappointed in it. And I, I think that's probably fair because the reason why this movie is successful, the reason why it's on the syllabus is because of the marketing. That's what makes it uh, so unique and so important in the horror genre in total. Uh, it really kind of pulled the wool over everyone's eyes and was effective in doing so. And that added a significant layer of scariness to it. The people that know that it's not real generally say that it's not scary. And I hear complaints like, well, you don't even ever see the witch, and, and which bums me out, if I'm honest with you, uh, because the way they build this movie up uh, and the mystery and the lore of the witch, there's nothing that they could have shown on screen that was going to live up to what your imagination was doing with that witch. Um, but people want to have, you know, jump scares and creepy things on screen and stuff. And and if you don't think this is real, if you don't feel like you're watching somebody get stalked and possibly killed for real on this on the screen, then then yeah, you probably don't find the the weird things that happen in the movie to be scary. Uh, the movie is full of uh, just weird noises that they hear in the dark and uh, they find weird, creepy things like stick figures and, and uh, uh, other weird things. I won't spoil it too much for you. Um, they realize at that point they're being stalked by something, but they don't know what it is. Is it a witch? Is it just crazy townspeople who are trying to scare them? And it's really, really effective, especially, again, if you're buying into it. And then the movie really played up into that, too. The movie starts out with a bunch of interviews of regular townspeople to establish the lore and the legend. Uh, and when the filmmakers made this, it was only semi-scripted. So some of the people that are being interviewed are actors and some of them are not. And 
they kind of interwove those things together and some of the people really ran with it and just kind of started spinning yarns uh and and making up creepy stories and it works really really well the three actors that play our three leads are also only semi-scripted and they didn't exactly know 100 percent what was going to happen which is uh, also leads to the to the verisimilitude of the movie it, it really comes off as real because they're really scared when they get scared in this movie and they're really starting to get strung out and get snippy with each other because they're they're working a long time and they're strung out and they're out there for a long long time so uh it really adds to that uh realism by having all of these uh these these steps the 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 directors took to to make it feel more real for both the actors and for the audience watching it to explain a little bit of just how effective this movie was when you thought it was real I had heard about it maybe about six months or so before it was released in theaters. And uh, it had been making the festival circuit. And I didn't see it, but I had read on the internet about, you know, festival circuits, uh, uh, people who had seen it, uh, and it was getting a lot of buzz. And I, I, was, I was so excited for it. And so I'd seen the website and everything. I knew, I knew that it was, you know, fake. Uh, I knew I knew the story behind it, but I was still really, really excited about it. And so I managed to track down a bootleg copy of it. Uh, on a VHS tape, actually, which I think I still have somewhere. I should have actually pulled it out for, for this video. But, uh, and for those of you who are younger, bear in mind, this is pre-torrent days. This is the early stages of the internet. So uh, when you're looking to get something bootleg or to get a, a bootleg copy of a movie, it's a physical copy. You need a physical a physical copy of the movie. Um, and in this case, on VHS, not even on a DVD. It's on a VHS tape. Uh, and it's a bad copy. It's 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 not a clean, good copy at all that I get, which honestly just kind of adds to the creep factor of it because the the footage is shot on uh, equipment that was probably pretty good at the time, but by today's standards, very very poor footage. The images are not very clear. They're not high definition, and um, the crappy VHS copy that I got of it just added to that a little bit. It made it really. Uh, seem like footage that you might have found lying out in the woods. Uh, so what I did is I had a bunch of friends over, like 12 friends over, to watch this movie. But I didn't tell them the truth about it. I told them that it was this movie that had been released, compiled of found footage of these three kids that had gone missing in the woods. Uh, and only one other friend of mine in the room knew the truth. So we watched this movie, and everybody proceeds to freak out. Uh, I remember distinctly that there was one girl sitting in the corner in a recliner with a blanket over her and her just her eyes is all you could see, like like a Jawa from Star Wars, just just like covered up in this blanket. She was so freaked out. And uh, uh, my one friend, Brian, really, really kind of lost. He just was like, we, we shouldn't be watching this, man. This this is wrong. We, this is not this is not appropriate. We shouldn't be watching this really, really bought in to the story uh, and really felt uncomfortable watching these kids get stalked. It was incredible it was like the best movie night of all time uh and my friend and i who knew uh the truth of it just kind of kept our mouths shut and watched these people spin out it was awesome and i imagine that's what people who saw the movie early on experienced and it's a bummer uh if you didn't get a chance to experience that if you saw it later on and you didn't get to experience the the uncomfortable thrill of watching it thinking it's real it's a shame because it really is an incredible experience. And uh, I don't know if there's anybody out there in the world who would believe that it's real at this point because it's so well known that I don't think that you can pull that uh, that shenanigans once again. Uh, and that's a bummer because I, I would even appreciate seeing somebody do a YouTube reaction video, uh, reacting to it for the first time thinking it was real. That would be a special way to relive that experience. I wish I, wish I had thought to do that at the time and, and film this group. It would have been classic. But... That was the power that the movie had. That was the benefit of the marketing campaign that was so clever. Uh, and again, this movie was made on the cheap. I think it was like six hundred grand or something like that. It was not uh, an expensive movie by any stretch of the imagination, and it made like two hundred and forty million dollars. I don't. Know, I didn't do the research uh, on this ahead of time on, on the box office, but it was an immense hit for peanuts uh, 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 of a cost for, especially for a, a motion picture. And which is why it started the, the the trend of people or studios making these found footage movies uh, because they were so cheap to make and the returns were very high. Even if you didn't make two hundred forty million, even if you only made a, like five or ten million dollars, the return on investment is astounding on that. So yeah, of course they were going to milk this for all it was worth, and they did.
One thing that the Blair Witch Project establishes is the endings for found footage horror movies. Um, the Blair Witch Project has a very strange ending that uh, uh, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but it just kind of stops and ends, and it's a really confusing ending. You have to remember that uh, uh, when they set something up earlier in the movie, uh, one of the interviews kind of talks about an event that happens, and then you see that event unfolding at the end, and that's that's how it ends. But if you forgot or didn't pay enough attention to that, to that interview in the beginning, you'll be confused as to what was happening at the end. Uh, and that was actually one of the problems with my uh, with my my bootleg copy is it it was an early cut that didn't have that interview in it, and so we were extremely confused at what happened at the end of the movie, which honestly kind of added to the eeriness of it. We kind of watched it over and over again, couldn't figure out what was going on. And I think that maybe the filmmakers realized that and added an interview to kind of explain the ending a little bit later on. But that kind of jump cut to black. Um, sudden ending where uh, everything just kind of suddenly ends and that's the end of the footage is a trope for found footage horror movies that gets pretty much pretty much uh, repeated or or copied throughout all the found footage horror movies uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more but yeah so it establishes many of the found footage tropes but not the least of which is the the sudden ending that I think people maybe find a little bit disappointing or a little bit frustrating. In addition to the slew of found footage movies that followed the Blair Witch Project, they did try to do a sequel to the movie uh, that was kind of seen to be a cash grab, and it's unfortunate because that movie's better than people give it credit for. A lot of people hate the movie, but I actually like it quite a bit for a couple of reasons. One, because they didn't try to do the same thing twice. It's not actually a found footage movie. Instead, it's a regular movie, but it's the kind of a meta take on the Blair Witch Project because it's about a bunch of people on a Blair Witch tour because the, that movie, the Blair Witch Project has come out in the world of this movie and uh, the, the town has become kind of a tourist attraction, which was true. That actually happened in real life. Uh, and these people were kind of going out there. They were fans of the Blair Witch and things happened to them. It's a really interesting premise, a really interesting concept. And I like that they took that different approach to it. That's uh, a fresh take on it. The other thing I like about it is um, the meta aspect of weaving in the found footage uh in the movie so it's not like we are seeing we know that those are actors in the movie but they've taken film themselves and that film is being shown in the movie as well so it's kind of got these layers to it that i really liked unfortunately as the story goes the the filmmaker who made this sequel uh kind of lost control of his movie the studio wanted to be a little bit more traditionally scary and uh, a little bit more mtv style editing and they they by all accounts cut it all up and re-edited it to the point where it's kind of hard to follow or some people would say incomprehensible and they're not necessarily wrong. And to date, there's never been a re-release or a director's cut of that. I would love to see the director's original intention because I think he had something really clever going on, a really interesting take on the story that I don't think was fully realized. So uh, Blair Witch 2 Book of Shadows, which is what it's called, uh, I think it's a little bit of an unfair shake as a result, but uh, I actually kind of like it. It's If you can go in with an open mind, I think it's worth checking out. They also did a reboot a couple of years ago just called Blair Witch. And that one really is more kind of like a remake or a rehash of the original. Uh, it takes place uh, modern day. Uh, and it's the idea is Heather Donahue's brother kind of looking for her. And it was an interesting premise. Uh, it hits a lot of the same kinds of beats, but it did do enough uh, to introduce new elements into the movie that I found it interesting. I think the best thing about it was they made this movie without anybody realizing. Uh, they did a premiere, I think it was at Comic-Con or one of the conventions, where the the movie was supposedly going to be a movie called The, the Woods, and they were doing a sneak preview of it, and then it turned out it was a Blair Witch sequel reboot. Uh, and that's pretty neat. I remember everybody on Twitter blowing up saying, oh, there's a Blair Witch sequel, and I got pretty excited about it. The movie didn't live up to my excitement, if I'm being honest with you. Um, there were some things about it that didn't quite work for me, and again, a lot of it's kind of treading the, the same ground. Uh, and there was a couple things they could have just they'd gone a little bit further. I, don't, I won't spoil it, but if they'd gone just a little bit further, I think they could have done something really awesome in connecting it with the original. Uh, but they didn't, and then I felt like in some cases they showed a little too much and relied a little bit on too, uh, CGI type stuff to kind of broke that realistic feeling of the movie so i don't love it but I, I did kind of enjoy it so it's worth checking out as i noted before blair witch tends to be a divisive film there are people that love it and people that hate it 
I'm one of the people that loves it, but again, I explained why uh, uh, why it holds a special place in my heart. I'd like to hear your Blair Witch experiences, if you had a good one or if you really were disappointed in it, if you were bummed out that you didn't see a Blair Witch or that it didn't do more scary things for you. I, I'd, I'd love to hear your comments down below about it. We can have a discussion about it. Um, again, I had a great experience with it because I got onto the train early and I feel like people that got onto it late missed out on a special experience. But let us know if that was your experience or if you had a good one uh, in the comments down below. The next movie that we're talking about, our graduate level movie, is Paranormal Activity. Now, Paranormal Activity came out in 2007, which is a good seven, eight years after the Blair Witch Project comes out. Uh, and that's noteworthy because I said earlier that the Blair Witch Project was widely considered to be like the start of the found footage craze. But there's a lot of people that would argue that actually it's Paranormal Activity. And they're not wrong. I think that between 1999 and 2007, you do see found footage horror movies, but you don't see quite as many as you do after Paranormal Activity. And I think it's because Paranormal Activity replicates the Blair Witch Project uh, formula without the marketing of trying to say that it's actually real. They knew that the audience was a little too sophisticated for it at that point, but it was still tremendously successful. Again, really low budget, really high returns. Paranormal Activity, if you haven't seen it, is the story of a young couple who buy a house and uh, they are starting to experience weird phenomena in the house. Uh, so the, the the boyfriend of the couple uh, starts setting up cameras around the house. He's like an aspiring filmmaker and he starts setting up like surveillance cameras and they start catching paranormal activity on the on the on the on the cameras. And it's very, very effective. Uh, it's a it's it's a ghost movie. We we touched on this a little bit in the ghost video that paranormal activity would show up somewhere else, and this is where it's showing up uh, again because I think its found footage uh, importance outweighs the ghost portion of the movie. Uh, and there's also, as I discussed in the ghost uh, uh, video, there's always some overlap between ghosts and demons, and that's kind of the case in here too. Again, I don't want to spoil things too too much, but um, this movie does deal with some mythology that. Uh, actually gets explained in sequels later on more than it does in the original movie. But the, the primary focus of the scares of the movie are creepy things happening. Doors opening and shutting, footprints showing up, um, uh, the, the girl Katie in the movie doing some weird things, acting in very strange ways. Those are where your primary scares come from in this movie. Now, like I said, um, this movie still managed to be successful and uh, is very popular despite people not believing in the reality of it. Again, it's presented like Blair Witch as like found footage that had happened after the fact, after the events of the movie. Uh, but I don't think that they really, truly tried to market it as actually happening. I don't think they were hiding the actors. I don't think they set up a website like the Blair Witch Project did. Uh, and I don't think audiences went into it thinking it was real for the most part. But people were still scared. And I think uh, it's for a couple reasons. One is because there's a lot of good jump scares in there. And jump scares are popular, especially at this time. Uh, when this movie comes out, people jump and, 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 they're, ah, and I'm scared. Um, uh, and then the other part of it, I think, is um, if you believe in ghosts, if you if you believe that, it's, that ghosts are real, um, then I think this movie really works for you. Uh, I don't think that even if, even if you know this movie isn't real, uh, I think you think that the events that are being depicted in the movie could be real. And I think that can scare you. Uh, I have a friend who who is kind of afraid of ghosts. This is one of his uh, his top scary movies, uh, and I think it's because he he believes that this stuff could happen. I don't think he thinks that it has happened to him or anything, but but I think he believes that it could happen. And so I think that that's uh, a a good um, a good litmus test for whether or not you're going to really be into paranormal activity is how you feel about ghosts. If you think ghosts are nonsense, you're probably going to look at this movie and think, wow, it's you know 80 minutes of uh, weird noises and and doors opening by themselves. Ooh, um, I fall somewhere in the middle of that. I think this is a well-made movie, and I enjoyed it very much when I saw it. Uh, I think that the gags work really, really well, and they do a good job of making the creep factor work in the movie. I think the two leads uh, sell it, especially uh, Katie Featherston as, as Katie. Um, she really sells it quite a bit. She's got uh, uh, she portrays somebody who's really kind of fraying at the edges from all these weird things happening really, really well. Uh, I side note, I actually uh, bumped into her at LA Live once uh, during uh, when they had the ice skating there during uh, uh, during Christmas time. Uh, very nice woman, uh, uh, kind of surreal. I wish I wish I had actually taken video of that. It would have been kind of fun to have like a found footage video of me with Katie Featherson. Uh, but that's just a side note. Um, the movie the movie is is effective. Uh, 
it really is one of the best examples of found footage movies, uh, mostly just because it's made really, really well. Uh, the movies that follow, the sequels, are not bad. Um, they are diminishing return. I think there's five sequels. Um, and each one gets a little less good as it goes on. But what I appreciate about it is that it tries to uh, continue the story and, and build out the mythology or the lore surrounding these acti- uh, these events, these, this activity. Uh, and I thought that was clever. I thought that was a cool way of, of doing it. It introduces some new themes, um, uh, which would qualify them for other subgenres, actually. Uh, but it works really well. well. They, they do things a little bit out of order, um, a little, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of prequel, sequel kind of things in the movies. Uh, so that is also something I kind of tend to like, the nonlinear storytelling. So uh, I like that the sequels try to do something a little bit more. Again, they, they kind of... Um, fall off in quality as they go on and and like most found footage movies and it's something that we didn't talk about earlier in the intro uh they they suffer from the same problems that uh that although that all found footage movies do which is they don't end well uh something that you know uh the blair witch project does as well uh you know they just kind of stop um the movies just kind of end you know something happens something crazy usually and it just ends and and, and paranormal activity and all of its sequels uh, are, are no example to the rule and honestly as they milked the, the found footage subgenre more and more uh, and the ending is kind of the same every time I, I think that lends itself to the audience getting a little bit burned out on it um, that said I do think this movie is good uh, if you haven't seen it you should check it out and if you really like it check out the sequels I think I think they're, they're worth your time uh, at least the first couple ones are uh, but yeah uh, if you, if you don't like the movie, uh, of course, tell us in the comments below why you think it falls short, but, uh, it's a pretty popular movie. I'd say this one is, uh, more universally liked than Blair Witch Project, so I would expect that most of you probably liked this movie, and if you did, tell us that too in the comments. And the last found footage movie we're talking about today, the postgraduate level movie, is Creep. Now, Creep came out in 2014. And it's a great example of a found footage psychological horror movie. If you haven't seen it before, the premise of the movie is this strange guy played by Mark Duplass hires somebody to, a videographer, to come and film his life, ostensibly to kind of uh, leave uh, notes or uh, uh, wisdom for posterity. Um, It's uh, kind of like a weird, creepy version of the Michael Keaton movie My Life, if you've ever seen that. Uh, And... And the whole premise of the movie is that, you know, uh, Mark Duplass's character is kind of a creep. He's, he's kind of creepy, uh, hence the, the title of the movie. Uh, and, and he's unpredictable and weird, and, and you're kind of put in the shoes of the videographer because you're seeing it literally through his eyes and just kind of wondering, like, what's this guy about? What's he going to do? And to say anything more than that would spoil the movie, so I don't want to do that. Uh, suffice to say that it's very effective at what it's trying to do. It's very effective at putting you in that spot of trying to figure out what's going on and feeling put off or unsettled by the antics and behavior of of your protagonist, uh, of Mark Duplass. Now, if you're not familiar with Mark Duplass, he, he does a lot of television work. He's popped up in movies, uh, but he's a, a big proponent of what they call the mumblecore uh, movement, which is... Uh, kind of like what Richard Linklater does with some of his movies, like the Before uh, Sunrise uh, trilogy, um, where uh, the actors kind of just have like a, an outline of where the story's going, and then they kind of just make up dialogue. It's kind of improv uh, If you ever watched the, the, the show The League, which, by the way, I highly recommend, even if you don't like fantasy football or football at all, that, that show's really, really funny. Even my wife liked it, and she hates football. Mark Duplass is in that show as well, and it really is a good example of the mumblecore technique of uh, a bunch of people who have a general idea of the plot and then just kind of make up the dialogue to drive the story that way. Creep is made in, in much the same manner. Uh, they have a general idea of what it is, but I, I suspect that the director didn't know exactly what Mark Duplass was going to do, uh, which I think just adds to the spontaneity and the creep factor of the movie. It really makes it an effective uh, effective uh, technique to, to convey to this movie, you have no idea where you're going to go, you have no idea what's going to happen, uh, and it really intrigues you, and it really leads to that sense of being on edge uh, or being uh, ill at ease when you watch the movie. It really, really works well. 
the movie is mostly in one location and made on the cheap, uh, as most of these found footage movies are. But I find that to be uh, an inspiring thing because uh, we'll talk about do-it-yourself horror movies later on in the syllabus, but you'll see that I have an affinity for low-budget stuff, things that people do on their own. I love to watch fan films on YouTube. I love to see people get creative with little to no money and just kind of putting their passion out there. Now, this one is, is pretty high quality compared to a lot of what you'll see in fan films or, or some of the do-it-yourself stuff that we'll talk about later. This movie's made much, much more professionally than that. Uh, it looks pretty pretty darn good. Uh, and I'm guessing they have put more money uh, behind it than the average YouTuber would be able to put behind their movie. But uh, I, th I find that kind of inspiring. I, I find it... Uh, 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 a goal for people to, to aspire to. If you're an a, a aspiring filmmaker, you can watch this movie and think, I could make something like this. I could make something that is as good as this. And, and I think you could. And I think that that's uh, another part of what the, makes the movie so successful is it's not a complex or complicated movie, both in terms of narrative and in terms of technique. And I think that that makes it accessible to people. I think that people relate to it in a way. And... and as a result, I think that people connect with this movie in a way that maybe they don't to a lot of other found footage movies. And that's why I wound up choosing it for the list because uh, the people that like this movie, the people that have seen this movie, tend to be really passionate about it. I'm one of them. I really, really like this movie. Again, I'm, I'm a Mark Duplass fan, so uh, it's kind of an easy sell for me. But it's a really, really well-made movie. Now, they did do a sequel to it a couple of years ago just called Creep 2. And I like that movie. I'll tell you the truth. It's not as good as the original primarily because... Once you've seen the original uh, and you've seen how it ends, you kind of know a little bit more about what Mark Duplass's character is about. So that mystery, that ambiguity of what is he about, why is he so weird, you kind of already know that, even though the, 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 the videographer in this case doesn't. And so you lose a little bit of that edge in the movie. But uh, what I like is that, unlike in the first movie where the, the videographer is kind of at the mercy of Mark Duplass's crazy creep um this one uh the the creep has met his match the videographer is also uh not so easily flummoxed and and kind of given as good as she gets and that's an interesting table turn for the movie um and that kind of gives it a different feel it's it's kind of a the reverse dynamic for a large chunk of the movie and that makes it more interesting so I would recommend Creep 2. If you like Creep, uh, check out Creep 2. Again, manage your expectations of it, but I do think it's a successful one as well. At a minimum, though, if you haven't checked out Creep, check it out because I think you'll really dig just how well-made it is and how those the performances of both Mark Duplass and I think it's Patrick Bryce. Yeah, Patrick Bryce, the who directed the movie uh, as the cameraman, uh, they really sell the, the tension in that movie. Their performances are a big part of why that movie works so well. So if you haven't seen it, check it out and let us know what you think. So those are our three picks for the found footage subgenre of horror. But uh, as you know, we like to give a few extra credit movies uh, to whet your appetite if you really like this subgenre. The first one we're going to talk about is The Visit. Now, The Visit was an M. Night Shyamalan movie that came out a few years ago, and it was something of a return to form for Shyamalan. I've talked before about being a Shyamalan fan or a Shyamalan apologist, uh, and I think The Visit was it was a return to form for him. It really did show everybody again just how good of a filmmaker he can be after he had several very disappointing movies in a row, and even I'm forced to admit that they were disappointing. This movie was something of a comeback for him of sorts. Uh, he made it with the Blumhouse production company. We'll be talking about Blumhouse quite a bit. Uh, they're a low-budget horror uh, production company, uh, uh, and they... They basically make movies for like about $5 million, and they, they made some really successful ones, uh, and, and The Visit was one of them. They made a lot of money. They made a good return on investment, um, and it gave Shyamalan a chance to kind of uh, do his thing and, and show everybody that he still had it. It is found footage, and it, it's a premise of two, two kids who go to stay with their grandparents who they've never met, and the grandparents act kind of strange, and I won't say anything more than that, uh, even though the trailer probably does give you more than that. But what I like the most about it is that the, the little girl who's filming is an aspiring filmmaker, so it kind of gives a reason for why her camera angles are so good and why her shooting is so well-framed, because, it, it, frankly, it's, it's actually Shyamalan uh, filming it, and Shyamalan's got a great eye. Um, he, know, he knows how to, to film something. So they kind of explain that away, like, why does this found footage look so good? Because it's made by an aspiring filmmaker. 
and she must be an auteur. Uh, I like that aspect of it. Uh, the movie is fun. Uh, it may be a little bit predictable. I'm not sure. Uh, so Shyamalan's known for his twists, and you, if you're looking for a twist, you're probably going to find one. But it, it, it's good. It's fun. It really did show uh, people who had forgotten that he can still make a good a good creepy movie if he really wants to. So it was fun to watch. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, I'd check it out. The next movie that I'm going to mention for extra credit is called Afflicted. And Afflicted is, of course, a found footage horror movie of two guys that go on a go on a trip, on a vacation, and uh, something happens, and one of them starts developing what can only be described as superpowers. And that's all I really want to say about that, because I don't want to say anything more, because I don't want to explain too much about it, because I think that might be spoiling it. I, I don't think that the trailer really tipped off anything more than that, other than it's, it's kind of superpowers, but it's also a scary movie. And that's really all you think you should. I think you should know. I think that the movie is very effective. The effects in it are really cool. Um, if you saw the movie Chronicle about superheroes, a found footage movie about superheroes, which I actually really enjoyed, this movie is kind of similar to that at a point. But then, it, of course, it goes very differently. Uh, but it has a similar vibe about this. You know, this guy suddenly being able to do amazing things. Uh, almost like superhero type things and it because it's found footage they look really neat like the effects look kind of real like like you're really seeing somebody doing this even though even though you know it's special effects you know it's not real it looks more real because of the found footage aspect of it it's a fun movie the performances are good in it uh again i'm kind of not trying to spoil too much so i don't want to say too much about it but if you haven't seen it check it out because it's it's really well paced it's a really good ride it's really exciting and i uh I know that the people who've seen this tend to really like it. It tends to be pretty popular, even though it's a lesser-known movie. So uh, I definitely recommend it to you. Uh, check it out and let us know what you think of it if you haven't seen it. And the last found footage movie I'm going to recommend to you today is uh, Willow Creek. And Willow Creek is another found footage movie, of course, about uh, a couple that go out into the woods in search of in search of Bigfoot. Um, and it's really charming because there's it's basically this guy who wants to kind of film his Bigfoot documentary and find footage of Bigfoot and his girlfriend going along for the ride who doesn't really believe in Bigfoot, but she loves him. And so she's kind of humoring him. And, you know, they talk to the locals in the area and then they, they talk to some people that are kind of threatening them. And then they go into the woods and of course, weird things happen. Now, the interesting thing about this movie is that it was directed by Bobcat Goldthwait. And if you're not familiar with him, he is a comedian and actor, probably best known for his, uh, his role in the in the police academy movies, uh, and he's a he's a weird dude, man. He's really really strange, but he directs the heck out of this movie. It's really really well made. Uh, again, you connect with those characters early on. You actually really start to like them. They have a charm to them, and so when they start getting terrorized later on, you, you're worried for them, and that's very very effective. And you're not quite sure what's going on. And uh, unlike some movies, I think this movie does a better job of. Um, the ending being a little bit more explained. Again, I don't want to spoil the movie, but uh, it, I wasn't 100% sure I followed it uh, after I finished watching it, but uh, you, some YouTube videos have explained that everything that you need to understand is in the movie if you're paying close attention to it. It bears a second viewing to see those connections, to figure out what happens at the end. It really is there. The answer to what happens at the end is in the movie, and I think that's really cool. That's good filmmaking. That's good storytelling. I might have to check out some other work by Bobcat. I've never taken him seriously because if you've seen anything he's done, you'd understand why. But darn if he's not really, really good filmmaker. Like the the tent scene at the end of this movie is so intense. It's so creepy. Um, it's really, really well made. So I really, really like Willow Creek. This is one that seems to be under the radar. A lot of people don't talk about this movie. Uh, I had heard about it for a long time and never bothered to get around to watch it. I only watched it fairly recently uh, and was very, very pleased. Uh, it's quite a ride. It's really enjoyable, really well made, uh, likable character, shot very well. Uh, Willow Creek, a great example of found footage getting it right. So even if you're burned out on found footage and you're just kind of like, you know, I'm kind of over these kind of movies, check out Willow Creek, man. Uh, it's a great example of uh, found footage doing it right. And uh, if you haven't seen it, you owe it to yourself to check it out and let us know what you think in the comments. So that's going to do it for today's found footage exploration. Uh, I think we've looked at some really good examples today of, of found footage movies. I know there's a lot of garbage ones out there. And, you know, if you want to rant a little bit about some of the garbage ones you've seen, uh, uh, you know, I'd love to hear some examples uh, in the in the comments below of movies that maybe we should avoid or why you think that we should avoid them. Uh, because 
you know, as much as I like to point out movies that we should see, maybe it's not a bad idea to tell some of us uh, in the comments movies we shouldn't see, movies that we shouldn't waste our times on. So uh, if you've got some examples of those, leave those in the comments as well. Uh, usually I tell you to put suggestions of movies that maybe you thought would be on here, and, and I'm inviting you to do that. By all means, please do. But bear in mind, we're going to be talking about mockumentaries pretty soon. So some movies that you think should have shown up here, probably going to show up in mockumentaries as well. Or maybe some other subgenres. I mentioned Cannibal Holocaust. Um, if you look at the horror movie syllabus, you might be able to figure out where that might be showing up. Um, but yeah, there's other movies that definitely could have been on this list that are going to show up in other subgenres. I didn't exclude them from other subgenres just because they were found footage. Uh, so there is a lot of overlap with the found footage subgenre and other subgenres. So there would be found footage movies popping up all over the place. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't mention which ones you like and which ones you think maybe should have made the list. By all means, put them down in the comments below. Let us know what your thoughts are. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. There's been some good conversations going on in the, uh, in the comments below. So I'm looking forward to carrying those on. Uh, I'm glad uh, to see you guys engaging. It really excites me. And uh, it's great for all of us to kind of start building up this community. So thank you guys very much for that. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for attending. And as always, class dismissed.